Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, and many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the Scubana e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Scubana is a software platform to manage your entire e-commerce operation. Now, all the way from Thailand, we have Manuel Bechva. He's the founder of Import Dojo. He's been living and working in China for over 10 years. You know, he travels between China and Thailand. With 17 years in the sourcing business, he has a unique perspective because he has his own brand. He sells to retailers and as a supplier, and he's worked with some of the biggest retailers in the world, developing, sourcing, and finding new products. And these include Walmart. Some you know you've heard of these: Walmart, Amazon, Lowe's, Sears, Home Depot, and many more. And he is the author of the Import Bible, the complete beginner's guide to successful importing from China. Manuel, how's it going? All good. Thanks. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah. Um, excited to be here. You know, I have to start. There's so many questions about mistakes to avoid with importing, secrets, common questions. But I have to start about. Tell me about when you met Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, it was funny. Um, it was in 2005. I, I met him at a luncheon. Um, he was governor of California back then, and he was doing a tour across Asia to uh, promote Californian products. Mm. So he was doing a speech. Uh, Jackie Chan was also there, actually. Uh, he was helping him on promoting things. And uh, at the end of the luncheon, he passed by our table and... Uh, I just said in German, hey, I'm a big fan here and admiring all of your work and your success, you know. And uh, he looked at me and he said, well, you must be pretty successful yourself because you're sitting here at this luncheon with your age. And so he was really surprised kind of to see me. And he said, keep going and see you at the top, you know. And uh, I was baffled that he, was, that he actually said something. And um, I was just 23 back then and that motivated me. To, yeah. to go for the stars, you know? <laughs> yeah, you know, when I was doing some research, it said so, what he said influenced you to start your own business. Mm. So what did you take from his words that motivated you? Um, I don't know. I was always a big fan because, uh, you know, he's Austrian, I'm Austrian, so right. we're kind of proud of him. You have the same and, size biceps, yeah. Um, <laughs> not even. <laughs> no, but um, it it just motivated me, you know, to be become success, success, successful at years, and uh, mm -hmm. obviously I'm not, but um, it it kind of pushed me, and it was such an experience that he actually said something, and I, I know it's silly, but it kind of motivated me and yeah. kept me going and um, made me want to be successful. Yeah, so. You know, with those, I mentioned some of those companies, Walmart, Amazon, Lowe's, Sears, Home Depot. Early on, when you started in the import business, what were the biggest mistakes that you made? Um, biggest personal mistakes that I made was uh, not really um, working organized and not having checklists, uh, having um, control mechanisms in place that um, make you help to uh, that that help you to control your suppliers and um, keep track of everything. So, um, you, for example, also doing proper background checks on the supplier. You know, mm -hmm. just trusting them blindly. And uh, I was very young back then, so I definitely have a lot of. But the most common mistakes I think are just not doing your proper research and not working organized with the supplier, not following up properly. Um, not calling them once in a while, you know, to check on the status of a of an order, maybe or of a sample, for example. Yeah. So, Mayo, what's the most important items on your checklist today that you have? Um, you mean in my business, or yeah, yeah, like when now you obviously have like a sy an actual system in place. Oh yeah. Um, what are some of the important things that you missed back then that you get now? Um, well, when I, I kind of work with a white uh, with a whiteboard uh, these days, and I work with uh, Excel files and uh, mm -hmm. Word file to do lists. Just drop down everything that I need to do during the day, or I have I set myself reminders constantly. 
I follow up and I'm, I'm very strict with, uh, with uh, I'm disciplined and I'm very strict with my to-do list, you know, so I kind of need to finish them day by uh, thing by thing on each day before I even let go um, for the day. So, so what about today? What's, um, what's on the checklist for today or on the agenda? Uh, when I look at the list, um, it's a couple of things, uh, promotional emails, I need to uh, prepare a new blog entry for tomorrow, um, I have a couple of emails that I need to reply, uh, it's early here so I just got up, <laughs> but uh, a long day ahead, I'm also working on the Canton Fair uh, that is coming up, so um, I'm scheduling a couple of meetings with suppliers mm -hmm. and uh, I also have a couple of customers coming over, so working on Canton Fair. Um, yeah, tell, tell people, for people who don't know what the Canton Fair, what is it, and then what do you, what do you hope to accomplish? The Canton Fair is the, um, the holy grail of, of all exhibitions in Asia. It's basically a um, twice a year held event uh, where all the suppliers of different product categories come to, to Guangzhou in South China and exhibit. The phase is about three and a half weeks long, and uh, is I mean the the exhibition is about three and a half weeks long, and it's separated into three phases. Each phase has different products, mm -hmm. and uh, suppliers can exhibit there, and obviously uh, buyers can come and, and visit and see the samples at the booth and talk to the suppliers directly, do a research and uh, find new suppliers and products. So how many years have you been going to this? Since I arrived, that was 2005, so oh. about 10 years. Yeah. It's twice a year, I don't go every time, uh, twice. Sometimes I just go to the one in, the, in April, sometimes mm -hmm. I go to you in know, October. So tell me, throughout the years, what are some of the big trends you've seen and the biggest surprises with either products or materials or what's going on? Uh, at the show itself? Yeah. You mean? Yeah. Um, it's not really that you see trends, big trends or surprises there. The the real trends and surprises are at the CES in, in Las Vegas or uh, at the SEBIT in, in Germany. Um, there's a couple of electronic shows, for example, in Hong Kong also, where you really see trends. The Canton Fair is really just like a big bazaar where you can go and find a supplier that you need for a specific product. Um, Actually, that is a surprise to most <laughs> buyers when they first come. They expect a lot of uh, new items and a lot of trends, but that is definitely not happening in there. Um, what you can find is common bread and butter products, and, and that's about it. And good suppliers. I'm not saying they're not good suppliers, but you won't find... They're reputable. Yeah, they're reputable and um, um, trustworthy, most of them. It's just nothing new there, you know, just... So how many people, what percentage of the people, obviously I know that um, you're kind of a thought leader in this space with the, you know, the import Bible and you have um, students, what percentage of your students do you tell them you need to get here, you need to come to this live and in person? The ones that are, that are advanced that, for example, have like two or three products running already, mm -hmm. um, we're talking Amazon, yeah. uh, or even if they're a small importer already and they're selling let's say successfully for a couple of months and they may be stuck with their existing supplier or they're just tired of looking only online and um, yeah, people in general who are interested to really push their business, get better prices, meet the suppliers directly, I recommend them to, to come to the fairs. But if you're just starting out maybe and um, you have an, ex an existing supplier, everything's running smoothly, um, and you need to focus on your um, maybe Amazon listing or improve sales or push boost the sales, then you probably should still stay at home and try to do it from, from, from back home online. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Emmanuel, I want to talk about it's, you know, about dealing, working with the big brands and what you, what you did and what you most valuable lessons um, from either Walmart, Amazon, Lowe's, what were some of the notable stories you remember when working with those companies? Um, the big companies try to uh, squeeze out every cent of suppliers 
Um, <laughs> it's not very easy working with the big retailers. First of all, uh, it's a very long process, so you can expect at least a year with the very big uh, companies before they, they even place an order. Um, I mostly worked with German companies in 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 my uh, my previous job before I started my own company. But before that, I was working in sales, and uh, we were catering different markets. For example, U.S., South America, um, uh, Western Europe, Northern Europe, and like some of those uh, clients were were the big ones, like Walmart, Carrefour, Target, uh, Amazon, and it's just. First of all, it's very difficult to to um, uh, to get in touch with them. Let's say um, my 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 goal back then, not my goal, my uh, like agenda. We, yeah, no, the my can we cut out things later? From I the I interview? just go unedited. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, no, my job back then, you know, my. Um, Job descriptions were sales, cold calling, um, mm. finding new clients in in, in the new markets right. um, that the company wasn't working in yet, and uh, you know, big companies um, they have like daily phone calls or emails from suppliers who want to work with them. Mm. So they're very they're very arrogant, first of all, um, and it's difficult to get in. That's for sure. So yeah. you either meet them through an exhibition or. You get referenced by another client of yours, or things like that. Um, but the most valuable thing I learned from working with retailers is to be uh, disciplined, actually, and to to follow up properly with mm -hmm. the suppliers because they have so many regulations and so many um, so many uh, requirements that mm. suppliers need to meet, like certifications, uh, test reports. Inspections. Um, you need to follow. You need to follow a, a line of processes that would be unimaginable for an Amazon seller. You know, the Amazon seller just finds a product online, or he sees it in China. Um, he places an order, and that's it. You know, right. all within a time span of maybe thirty to forty days. And there's just a lot of uh, pre preparations and uh, talks and meetings and. Sample sending and yeah. negotiation with suppliers when you work with retailers. So, Emmanuel, obviously you've been doing this for for seventeen years, and and you mm. kind of give back and, and teach people. What were some? Who were some of your mentors, and what were the big lessons they taught you along the way? Along the way, um, I'm not sure. I really have a mentor per se. Um, my I mean, were there people was, within the importing companies you worked for that kind of, was there anyone that kind of took you under their wing or was it just trial by fire and you just learned by making mistakes? Um, it was more or less learn by doing, learning by doing uh, yeah. from the beginning. Um, I mean, I was lucky that each supervisor or each boss that I had was, um, took me under his wing and, uh, and I learned a lot from each one of them. Um, I learned from one person, I learned a lot of, uh, a lot of sales then in the other company I worked for uh, I learned a lot about manufacturing processes itself you know like uh, metal stamping designing engineering and so on mm -hmm. and then the last boss was he was not uh, he was not the best boss but he was um, uh, he was very dedicated to his products and uh, he also backed me up a lot when, when I made a mistake mm -hmm. or uh, he taught me a lot of lessons to be dedicated to your product, to to focus on your clients, and uh, not ever trust suppliers. <laughs> I guess that's key. So being lesson. very thorough, it goes back into your checklist to just yes make sure that yeah. you're very thorough and following up. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. I guess. Oh, yeah. So, <clears throat> what are the most common mistakes you see your the people you help? What are they making when they start importing? Uh, I think it's not having agreements in place when you when you place an order with a supplier and mm -hmm. uh, uh, you don't do your background check. Um, I mean, I personally go to to every factory. Yeah, um, you have the luxury to be like in China. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But I, I, I realize that not everyone can do that. But um, uh, I would never place an order online to to a supplier that I 
don't even know, you know. Of yeah. course, I will. Uh, if I can't go visit him, um, I probably ha have him send me uh, company presentations. Uh, I want I want to see a list of clients that he works with. Um, I probably send an inspector inspector to the to factory before before I place an order. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not sending inspectors to to every factory. I or I don't go to every factory before I place an order. Mm -hmm. Just before I really place an order, I need to be absolutely sure through thorough background checks, um, uh, having either visited or sending an inspector there, or I'm absolutely sure because they got a lot of references from other clients, something like that. Um, so when you're, from, when you're ordering online from overseas, biggest mistakes I think are not doing thorough background check and you know, yeah. uh, a lot of people just buy through Alibaba. And they think because a supplier has three-year uh, gold membership, it's safe to buy with them. It's not, you know. Uh, you can simply buy this um, membership uh, with with Alibaba. So, right. Do your background checks on on suppliers and be thorough. What agreements should people have in place? Um, I usually have a an um, a buying agreement. Um, it's it's like a word file, a couple of pages. Mm -hmm. I don't do it with, with every supplier um, that he has to sign it. Mm -hmm. It's got a couple of terms in there, like what happens if there's late shipment uh, or there, if there is any damage to the product mm -hmm. the, during the transport. Right. So um, you're protected. I have to. Yeah, yeah. I have, I'm sort of protected, but uh, nothing happened so far. But um, knock on wood. I'm sort of protected. Yeah. Um, but. I don't do that with every factory. For example, if I only have a small order of two, three, four, five hundred pieces, and the total order amount is even below two thousand US dollar, I probably um, just you know make sure that everything is very clear in the email. That um, I give him bullet points what happened if there is late shipment. Uh, I tell him probably that there will be an inspection um, that I pay for. But if, if there is any mistake during the order, he has to pay for it. And so on. So, yeah, just list it in in the email when you send the, the supplier the order. Yeah, and you know, man, I was reading one of your posts, and what's interesting, what you do is you make improvements to current products um, that the yes. the suppliers have. You know, whether it's design or function. And a question that comes to mind is: so, how do you keep them from rolling out and copying? The improvements because oh yeah manual this is great let's just roll this out to other customers let's sell it so how do you handle copies um, or patents or things like that how should people navigate that uh, it's difficult um, obviously or hopefully the supplier will never use your packaging for example yeah. um, for my brand Mandarin gear I have my own packaging and I trust that the supplier will not use my packaging. That is one point. Uh, mostly they can't anyway because they don't have the, the file to edit it. That's on my side. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of design, it's it's the supplier's design. Like you said, I'll, I'll just take their design and change maybe the, the outlook. For example, I have this um, tablet speaker here. Uh, when I first saw it, it was um, shiny plastic. You know, uh, sound was like really bad. Uh, it was like two watt, something like that, and the battery was um, only lasting for two hours. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was cheap. So I took the product, um, I changed the finishing into the rubber finishing that it's now. Uh, I increased the, uh, the lifetime of the battery, um, and um, yeah, I had my own packaging, obviously, and I inc uh, increased the, the power of the speaker. So I had a certain quality uh, quantity that I need to meet to to actually make those changes, but yeah. it's not so much higher than the original MOQ from the supplier. So I trust that if they want to sell it um, under the same conditions to other customers, um, I guess they also need higher quantities, and um, that's not really how you protect. Um, yeah. I do have non-disclosure agreements in place uh, with with my suppliers, yeah, yeah. at least with with those products. Um, and you know, if if it happens, it happens. Uh, I mean, I can't be, um, uh, I shouldn't be too 
grumpy or too too upset about it. You know, um, if it happens, it happens, and it just means that I'm successful and they want to copy me. Right. But How hard is it to change those things? You know, like is it just a matter of telling them I want the battery life to be seven hours, or do you have to actually give them some actual research of what they need to do? Well, if it's very obvious that it needs to be improved, and yeah. they're probably maybe selling it only in the domestic market, but they never sold online. Actually, uh, are they only sold, um, for example, within China? Yeah, uh, a lot of suppliers actually welcome customers suggestions okay. like how to improve the product so that they can sell it to other customers yeah. as long as they don't sell yeah. it uh, so they know what to do if you say i want the battery life to be seven hours i want the you know i want the the volume to they, be higher they can just do that with you telling them they they do that they yeah. know that and uh, if they don't move on you know find a new supplier because mm -hmm. that it means it's either a pure trading company they don't have any engineers or they don't have the the means to to improve the product, or yeah. they're not willing, you know. And if they're not even willing in the first few stages of discussing an order to improve the product, yeah. um, how is the relationship going to be when you work with them? Actually, yeah. you know, and so move on, find a new supplier. Yeah, I mean, you know what? You said something really interesting which I never thought about, which is if you're dealing with a, a factory, a manufacturer, mm -hmm. to send an inspector there. Um, because I think people, that makes sense actually for people even doing business in the U S you can't just hop on a plane all the time. If you're, you know, crossed from one's in New York and one, the office is in California, what do you tell the inspector to look for? And what kind of person, uh, if someone wants to find an inspector, what do you look up to, uh, have someone go to the facility? Um, well, basically, um, I work a lot with, uh, Asia inspection. Mm -hmm. um, you can book everything online. Uh, they give, uh, it's a very clear process. I mm -hmm. think I go through it also on my blog. Um, and you can tell them, you know, um, for example, if I know that, that the, the product has problems um, maybe on the packaging because it's very thin or, um, or the supplier has told me there is some issue or maybe I read a bad review on Amazon about what is not good about the product, you know, mm -hmm. then I probably tell the inspector right, uh, I mean, I will tell him right away that these points are the ones he has to focus on. But on the other hand, um, when they send an inspector, uh, they actually always use someone who is specialized in that category. So, for example, mm -hmm. if you have a production of T-shirts, the inspection company is not going to send one who who's very experienced in electronics, you know, they're right. going to send one who's experienced in, in textiles. Yeah, that makes sense. And then, I don't know if you find this, is there the same type of service in the U.S.? Or is it just more like an Asian inspection? Um, you mean from that particular company? or no, Yeah, from that company or... Like if someone's looking to do the same thing for U.S. manufacturers? Uh, I think Asia Inspection does a lot um, within Asia, like Turkey, mm -hmm. uh, India, Vietnam, Cambodia, mm -hmm. China, and so on. Um, I don't know any company in the U.S., to be honest. Yeah. I'm pretty sure there well, are You're some. the import dojo, so you don't have to. <laughs> but um, So you mentioned some common mistakes, you know, background check agreements, um, you know, getting that inspected. What else do? What other mistakes do you see people making? Um, payments. Uh, for example, they don't agree on on payment um, terms. Like, just uh, they accept suppliers' payment terms just blindly. Like, for example, hundred percent upfront, or they let them talk into uh, Western Union payments or. Um, they don't check, for example, bank account details. Let's say um, if I if I receive an invoice from a supplier and the the bank information doesn't make sense at all with any information that relating to the company. For example, if the company's name is Ningbo um, Xing Feng, and then on the banking information it says. Um, Cayman Islands, Greg, something, you know, then obviously people don't check, you know, uh, they just blindly transfer money uh, yeah. across the globe. 
Um, so that's a big mistake uh, a lot of people do. Have you seen that uh, happen where someone basically get is that like a fraudulent? They just get oh, taken. I read a lot. Of, yeah, I read a lot about uh, that on the Facebook groups. Yeah. Personally, I don't know anyone that it has happened to, but uh, I, I think I read it like once or twice a month at least mm. on on the Facebook groups, and um, it surprises me. Yeah. I mean, you you don't do that when you. <laughs> Even in the U.S., you don't transfer money to someone without checking references. Right. I guess. What's typical yeah. as far as um, terms? Like if you know, because someone uh, manufacturing facility could say one thing, and you know, the person in the back of their mind could be wondering, "Is this normal? Is it not normal? What's what's typical as far as that goes?" Uh, typical within the retail industry is um, LC payments, letter of credits. Um, or TT transfer, like 30% down payment, 70% mm -hmm. after after shipment or upon shipment yeah. or even before shipment. Yeah. Um, what is also widely used is the um, documents against payment. So basically the supplier has to front all the money for the raw material and production and then you pay him um, uh, upon shipment or upon presentation of documents. But um, it's not going to happen online or with suppliers that you find on Alibaba. Um, this usually only happens when, when you work with a supplier for a long time and say you've done business with him in the amount of 50 to 100,000 US dollars, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, man, typical, what, go ahead, what's typical? Yeah, typical uh, payments online is, I guess, uh, PayPal. Everyone's trying to use PayPal. But it's not typical in the in the retail industry at all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what's the biggest <clears throat> nightmare you've experienced? The biggest nightmare I've experienced: um, a supplier once sent out um, a shipment without me having released it, and um, he sent it to the harbor, and he was telling us, me and the buyer, that um, yeah, it's about to be shipped, and we should. Uh, make the payment uh, and release the documents also and uh, I didn't agree with it because the, the production had some issues and the buyer convinced me, tried to convince me that goods have to be sent back to the factory and um, has to have to be reworked so uh, and the supplier wouldn't agree to do, do to do that and goods the goods were at the harbor and they um, and they were charging us day by day Oh wow! Uh, for port, port fees, and I think after two weeks, the the supplier wouldn't budge, and uh, the supply uh, the buyer eventually agreed. So he had to pay um, the fees and uh, oh, man. also accept faulty products. And uh, needless to say, he never worked with me again. <laughs> but I I didn't either with the supplier. So yeah, you were stuck in the middle there. Yeah, sometimes it's. Um, even though you you follow all your your processes and you make sure everything goes right, sometimes things go wrong. You know you can't do anything and right. you just try to, um, to do the best you can to have a positive outcome for the buyer, even if it's not. Sometimes you you end up losing. Yeah, Emmanuel. What are the most common questions that you get from e-commerce sellers that are already selling? Um, how to find the perfect product? <laughs> and, the goal, uh, that's the holy grail, right? That's the most asked question I get. Mm -hmm. And uh, another question I get is how do you s vet suppliers? Um, for example, I have a video uh, on my blog uh, about Alibaba mm -hmm. where I give a lot of uh, examples how you can verify a supplier. Mm -hmm. So I point people to that video and in general, read um my book um yeah i mean i, have I watched a, that video I, yeah okay yeah. <laughs> i have a peop, sometimes i feel that people are they don't take their time to to build a business you know yeah. they hear on a podcast or on a facebook group oh i made uh, thirty thousand dollar this month you know and they want to um duplicate overnight that person's success yeah overnight and they're not willing to invest the time to yeah. To read books, to to go onto groups, to yeah. uh, learn, you know. So I just, I mean, I wrote a seventy pages book that's out there for free, and it covers everything. So right. mostly, I just tell people 
please read the book or right. do more research. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> People want the shortcut. They want the shortcut, yeah. and there's no get rich quick scheme in this industry. So right. uh, you got to learn. So to on that on that sense, Manuel. So what resources do you recommend? Obviously, the Import Bible. You know, you have that free i mean there's other you know, blog posts that you put out there what other resources out there should people be looking at to get the information to start to build their business um there's a couple of of other blogs from other people um for example ryan's fba journey um then of course there's the the amazing seller he covers a lot on um on the on the fba process and um, he's got some good resources, I think uh, over 100 episodes right now. Mm -hmm. um, then, for example, Global Sources has an educational blog uh, that's called Smart so no, China's, ChinaSmartSourcing.com mm -hmm. uh, or SmartChinaSourcing.com. Anyway, it's on Global yeah. Sources. It's an entire page full of tutorials, videos, um, texts, PDFs. You're on, their, you're on their website also. Yes, I yeah. recently started blogging for them yeah. also, or they take my posts and then blog, reblog. Yeah. Um, what else? Um, if you Google how to import from China, for example, well, there's then your books will come up. That's all that comes up. <laughs> yeah, page, page two, I think. <laughs> uh, but there's also online courses. I yeah. mean, um, um, obviously, I have a course, but there's other people who. Who have uh, equally good material? Yeah. What advice do you give to people about the perfect product? You said that that is the most common question people ask. Uh, there is no perfect product. <laughs> I think um, you just pick a product and you go for it. Of course, right. you you should analyze numbers and yeah. stuff. Um, I mean, what are people with, expecting when you say that? Typically, I mean, when they ask that, are they beginners? Are they people you know who have been doing it for a while? Who's asking that? Um, I guess people who are stuck maybe with yeah. paralysis analysis, analysis paralysis, um, and people who just started maybe mm -hmm. and they don't want to do the work. Mm -hmm. They just, you know, uh, they. I mean, it's okay to 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 ask for help, you know, yeah. but everyone has to decide for his own product. Yeah, that's why. Also, I mean, for example, I offer a so sourcing service, but I only help on finding suppliers. Everyone needs to find his own product because I don't want to be held responsible if if it tanks, you know. If I source it for him, he purchases it and then it doesn't work out. I mean So basically it, they say, I wanna do this iPhone charger and you will find you will find you will source it for them? Yeah, I, I, I do that. I mean first of all I tell him don't do that product. Uh, I do give advice on which right. products are good and which are not. Yeah. Because, so which uh, are which are horrible that people should not do? Uh, too much competition. For example, if you take smartphone accessory like uh, yeah. a travel charger or an uh, iPhone charger, you know. Mm -hmm. First of all, you need to uh, make sure that the, the iPhone charger has certification. Otherwise, when when you sell it and uh, Apple products actually tell you when you uh, for example, you want to charge uh, iPhone with a very cheap uh, charger. Um, iPhone, I think, pops up and says, uh, this is not an original, I don't remember the exact mm. pop-up, but it says this software may not be um, compatible. So that's because the supplier doesn't have certification mm -hmm. and they're not allowed to, to sell Apple products. Yeah. So that's the first thing I would tell them. Um, I, I would probably give advice and say okay look there is a lot of competition or um, you need certain certification um, so what are some products. other products you steer people away from uh, if they're starting out maybe um, anything related to to drugs like uh, medical products or supplementary products uh, dietary products um, baby products like baby accessory like mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, I don't know uh, baby bottles something yeah. like that or why why do you tell them to steer away from that it's highly regulated uh, mm. uh, in the US um, you know the product does not uh, doesn't uh, is not allowed to 
contain any chemicals that mm. could cause skin irritation on a baby. Right. Um, it needs to have FDA certification. Um, so these are very uh, highly sensitive products. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd ask them to stay away. Very easy products could be household items, um, sometimes textiles, uh, decorative items like maybe seasonal products for Christmas, you know, just some decorative items. Um, those are simple, easy products for gardening or uh, lawn and gardening products. Mm -hmm. um, some some tools could be easy products. Yeah, health and, and medicine uh, are difficult, and they're also ungated because of regulatory. Is that why you tell people to steer away from them? Yeah, and um, I, I I want them to to learn the process first and not dive into the most difficult um, right. categories right away. Right? Yeah. So what um, trends, since you do you know, a little bit of everything, the sourcing too, what trends should people be looking into as far as categories go for, you know, obviously there's no perfect product, but maybe there's like a, you're seeing a upward trend of a particular category that people should look into. Um. I mean, electronics are uh, uh, coming more and more, you know, and um, you don't see trends within the household industry. Um, you see trends in, in consumer electronics. Mm -hmm. Or, um, I mean, what I suggest is go look onto Kickstarter and yeah. look at the most trending products, and then you'll see which categories are most trending, and it's usually electronics. Right. So, look into electronics. I know that a lot of people say stay away from electronics, but yeah. if you follow regulations, if you have certifications from suppliers, yeah. uh, go for it because the margins are one of the best out there. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I sell electronics and I don't have a problem. Right. I mean, Talk uh, about that for a second, Manuel. So Mandarin Gear, um, what was your first product? Uh, I didn't really create any product, like like I said, I, I took existing items and then I improved them, put them into a packaging and sell them to, to retailers. Right. Um, but my first product that I sold was um, um, a, a Bluetooth speaker. Yeah, mm -hmm. a Bluetooth speaker. Um, and what, a, what made you decide to, to do that? Tell me the thought process. Well, I was handling the, this product category in, in, my, in my last job mm -hmm. um, before I started my own company. And uh, I saw this this item at the at the supplier when I was still working for them, and uh, you know I kept having the thought of starting my own company. And I took this item and introduced it to a buyer, and I said, uh, "Would you be interested in this item?" And uh, he said, "Yeah, sure." Uh, he actually wanted to to purchase it, and then I think within a couple of weeks I quit my job and started my own company and. That buyer was actually my first client. It was a retailer. I didn't sell it on Amazon. I sold it in, in the retail. And uh, yeah, I guess that product, that Bluetooth speaker, helped me to start my own company also. So I don't know if you could talk about it or not, but what kind of order does a retailer make for something like that off the bat? Uh, that particular item was 2,000 pieces. Huh? 2,000 pieces, yeah. Um, I think I made a profit of... Uh, two dollar fifty each, so there was five thousand pieces, uh, five thousand US. Um, that's a good start. You, that's a good start. Yeah. Uh, it was not my biggest profit, but um, it was a good start. Yeah. So um, what do you do retail. from there? You know, retail. Obviously, that's. I find that most people are not doing that. They're going direct to consumer. So, what are some things people should know about going to retail um, that you did and. You know, with that, um, how did you start to branch off from besides that retailer to other other retailers? Um, well, I collected a lot of contacts um, in the last ten years in, right. in Asia, and um, uh, I kind of come from the retail industry because when I was back in Austria, I was working in retail, so I kind of knew who the players were, yeah. and. Uh, I think before I, when I really started uh, my own job, my own company, I just systematically went through the list of contacts that I have, and then I just 
blindly emailed, fired out emails, you know, to everyone that I knew. And obviously, I prepared um, my own PDF catalog. I had nice photos. I had put promotional texts mm -hmm. uh, for my emails. Um, so it was not day one. I'm starting, and now I'm emailing some customers. I was preparing a lot in, in terms of material. And um, you know, once you send an email, you uh, you call them. A couple of days later, you call, uh, even if it's a cold call and you don't really know them. You know, you just need to follow up and be persuasive with them. Yeah, I mean, is there a particular? Let's say someone's dealing in the U.S. Is there a particular job title that people should? Because, like you said, the companies are so big. Who do you even reach out to? Is there a particular? Oh, it's the manager of product development, or is there a common job title people should be looking at? Um, well, in Europe, most of them are called, it's different sometimes, most of them are called either buyer or head buyer mm -hmm. or um, head of purchasing or Simple product, manager, yeah. product manager, electronical division mm -hmm. or uh, purchasing manager. But, well, you, you may want to um, approach always the head of a division, like even if it's a buying director, mm -hmm. if you have his contact, you know, email him and then call him. Yeah. So, Manuel, what was your next product? So, you had the Bluetooth speaker. What was next? Uh, I built a whole, uh, I built a whole assortment around the Bluetooth speaker, um, smartphone accessory, um, tablet speakers. Uh, what else did I have? Headphones, uh, earbuds. Uh, yeah, a anything related to Bluetooth, really. Anything with music, because um, I'm an avid uh, music. Mm. I, I love music. I need it when I work. Um, so anything relating to music, really. Uh, all in all, it's about 25 products right now in my assortment. Yeah. What's the most popular? Um, the most popular is uh, a headset I created. Um, I, I more or less created this one because it's it's quite unique. I can't say much about it because I'm also launching it on on Amazon now mm. um, under my brand, and um, it's a headphone. It's good quality. It's very it's very um, competitive price. Um, sound is good. Yeah, one of the most popular. What I sold it already to to a, to a retail in Europe. It's just right now launching online. Yeah. Um, for that, what's been the one that surprised you that thought you thought this is the product that's going to take off and then it didn't do as well as you thought? Uh, it was also a speaker, uh, but it was, uh, or it was an existing design in the market and it was going really well. It was, um, more looked like, looked like a block, but it was twisted. It looked, looked like a candy speaker okay. and uh, I got onto that as well I, I changed a bit the color and the packaging but uh, when I got into the market with my client um, it was already saturated, saturated. and uh, yeah so I more or less had to sell it below cost yeah. what makes you you know I find too a lot of people are very private about this stuff you know they do not want to tell people their name of their company they don't want to tell people what they sell what makes you so open? Well, for one, the products that I have on my page, Mandarin Gear, uh, they're all available uh, within the retail market. So yeah. anyone can buy them. Um, but if I have someone coming and say, oh, okay, I want to sell it on Amazon, and I already sell that one to a retailer in, in Europe, I don't, I don't do that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because I don't, then I um, destroy my, my client's price um, because anyone can buy it on Amazon now. Right. Um, other than that, I, I'm not very open to what I'm selling on Amazon. Actually, I'm not telling anyone. <laughs> you I aren't. Mean, I do have, uh, no, I do have, um, uh, I can tell you what my first product on, on Amazon was. Um, but that's about it. I'm still selling it. <laughs> but uh, other than that, I'm not so open on my products on Amazon. But the ones I sell to retail, anyone can see. Yeah. So you can talk about what the first one you put you sold on Amazon, which is what the headphones. No, no, the oh. the first product I sold on Amazon was a stainless steel uh, luggage tag. Um, really? I ordered. That's yeah, really. Uh, I ordered five hundred sets, um, and uh, 
well, the story goes like this. Um, so I was receiving mail from uh, uh, Emirates, and I got my freaking flyer card. And I was like, oh, that looks nice, nice you know. And they, they got a luggage tag as well. So you get three cards. Yes. Um, one is for the wallet, two is for um, for the luggage with a um, stainless the steel. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, and I said, that looks nice, you know. So what about what about people that do not have frequent flyer miles, you know? Maybe they want to have a nice tag as well. And that's how I came up with the, the luggage tag, the stainless steel luggage tag. And um, I think within a few days, I ordered, found a supplier, I ordered 500 pieces, and I sold them out really quickly on Amazon. So why would you talk about that and not the others? What's And this is pretty common. Because right now, uh, I think I have like 15 competitors. So be my guest, you know. Gotcha. I mean, I have a lot of, I have a lot of reviews already, and uh, I'm selling mine. And you know, even if it does sell, I'm not saying I'm gonna sell it forever. So mm -hmm. I'm always looking for new products, and uh, I'm always trying to expand my category into other products. Yeah. So yeah. I'm always just curious about this secret of nature um, that I've, you know, over the past six months really experienced with people, and mm -hmm. um, so I'm just always wondering the reason why. And so, with it, when you sell on Amazon, are you selling all over the world, or do you do you choose certain countries? No, it's just dot com, dot com. So um, it's easiest for me also because I'm based in Asia. Yeah, um, I'd be open to selling to I think UK and uh, Germany are number two and three in terms of uh, sales and customers. I'd be interested to sell them there in at a later stage, but right now only dot com. Any other platforms you're considering or that you sell on besides Amazon? Um, there are actually a couple in Asia um, from um, Rocket Internet. It's a big German company mm -hmm. and uh, um, it's called uh, Lazada here. Mm -hmm. They're all over Asia, Indonesia, Thailand, mm -hmm. um, Vietnam, Singapore. Uh, so I've been thinking of listing there. I'm already in the process of talking to them, but there's a lot of contracts and it's not as easy as fulfillment by Amazon. Um, that's why I love Amazon because it's so simple for for sellers to list mm. their I mean, it's not simple. You have to follow rules and procedures and so on, but um, it's the most successful business out there, uh, fulfillment business. The ones in Asia are not <laughs> so, so easy, to be honest, but uh, there's a big market out here too. So maybe Asia next. So. Yeah. yeah, I'll have to send you. I just talked to someone who talked about all the platforms there um, in South Africa. And they were yeah. talking about places in Russia and that are, you know, talking some of the trends in the marketplaces. I think you'd like that. Um, and they were talking about the rocket internet also. Mm. Um, and so, you know, what do people like most? What do you find the best feedback either uh, a certain story from the import Bible or uh, a certain lesson that seems to resonate most for people? I think people really like my Alibaba video, hmm. the screencast that I made, um, but also that I, I outline step by step. Um, you know, when you, when you read my book, it's really where do I start and where does the order end? Uh, obviously, then it goes to Amazon and I don't, um, uh, cover that in the book, but every import step, um, import from China step is in the book. Maybe there's more details in, in each step, but yeah. I can cover really pretty much the basics that get everyone started. And just recently I got an email that um, work from a work at home mom, you know, and she said she's been thinking about importing a long time already and the book finally gave her the push to do it, you know, because mm -hmm. It sounds so easy. Obviously, it's a it's a difficult process, but um, it can be done. And um, the the fact that it covers really the basics, I think that's what most people like about it. Yeah. So before talking to you, Manuel, I reached out to some e-commerce um, people who run e-commerce businesses. <coughs> I said, "What questions do you have for the Manuel, who's an expert in import?" And oh. some of the questions were about Chinese sellers. Those are the most common questions I got. What are Chinese sellers doing well? 
And well, I'll start with that. What okay. are Chinese um, sellers doing well? I nothing in particular, to be honest. Um, the only thing they're really good at is prices. You know, they have better prices because they're mm -hmm. directly at the source. Um, but I don't think they do anything particularly good. I had a, a blog post about. Uh, I think six weeks ago. It's called "Don't Worry About." Amazon I read that. Yeah. For now, yeah, and I think it pretty much outlines why people don't have to worry yet, yeah. because Chinese are completely different in in their thinking and their culture. You know, when it comes to to sales and customer mm -hmm. service, is not important for them. You know, yeah. for 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 us, what is really common sense? Sometimes yeah. they don't even think about that. I mean, right. not to be mean or rude or anything. It's just not within their culture right. to to care about customer service, and that's one thing that they won't be good at in the near future either. So, yeah. um, the only thing I think they're good at is lo the logistics part and the prices. So right. maybe they have a bit more profit, but in the end, they may have more complaints from customers. You know? Yeah. So. Yeah, so the question was that, and they said, well, how do you combat it if they're selling on Amazon, you know, to me? And I, I said, you know, I, as you know, Manuel, I do a lot of research. So I said, I know exactly how he's going to answer this question. There's no point in me asking it because he has a blog post on the, exactly what you just said. Um, I said, I'll ask it anyways, and I'll push back a little bit because he's going to say that's not their mentality. They want, because in your blog post, you say they want the money up front. They don't want to have to create the products and then sell it. Right. Yeah. And then I go, well, that's exactly what he's going to say, you know, and you did. And so we had this back and forth. And then I said, well, they go, well, what about, um, but they can double their money. You know, they can sell at a higher margin. Right. So, yes, that is true. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe not double, but maybe 20% more. Well, I think that suppliers make more than. 15 to 25, 30 percent, maybe these days. Right. Uh, I mean, obviously, with their own developed products, and if it's a really trendy design, then maybe, but common trading items are even lower, maybe five or six percent. So, if they're selling, if they're starting to sell a garlic press on Amazon, and maybe they're the factory directly, right. okay, they make maybe five or six percent more than the Amazon right. seller in the US. So, that's not really um, an advantage. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I don't think they have really a big advantage. And also, they just, I mean, Amazon has been in the ground in China for the last two years, mm. uh, teaching people uh, Amazon is available in Chinese. Um, so, yeah, it's, they've been there, but it's still just in the beginning. It's like China, for example, is slowly moving into um, higher efficiency manufacturing, mm -hmm. like Taiwan did 25 years ago. You yeah. know, Taiwan is, yeah. for example, a, a high-end manufacturing country, yeah. um, and China is still very, very far away from that. I mean, you've got 1.3 people you need to teach. <laughs> uh, right. 1.3 billion, yeah, or even more. Um, so it, it's a long process. It takes time, um, and yeah. you know, most Amazon sellers are in the business for maybe longer than two years already. So they have a, a long head start. I mean, so if a, let's say a uh, China manufacturer mm -hmm. goes head to head with you, you know, they start mm -hmm. putting stuff on Amazon. Is there anything you can do to combat that or, or how would a seller better compete? I have a mailing list of 5,000 people. So <laughs> deal with that supplier. You know, um, that's one of the things that, you can really boost your sales um, in in the beginning or to launch a product with a mailing list mm -hmm. or Facebook groups. I mean, there's no Facebook in China. Um, there's no Yahoo. There's no Gmail. There is no yeah. CNN, whatever, you know, a lot of sites blocked in there. So we in the West have a lot of, um, we have more advantages. We can, we can use tools that Chinese people cannot use. Mm -hmm. um, Lots more. I mean, websites. I don't think Chinese people invest money in building a website around their brand. I mean, when you look at a, a Chinese factory's website, it's horrible English and 
um, the photos are really bad quality, and uh, we know um, we know exactly what to do to attract customers. You know, we Westerners. So I don't think it's a big issue. Yeah. At all. You know, so you know, many of your students probably sell on various platforms. What do you recommend them when they ask you, okay, I, mean, you know, I want to increase sales, I want to boost sales? What do you tell them? Yeah, like I said, having a, a mailing list helps a lot. Obviously, it takes a long time to build a mailing mm -hmm. list. Um, well, you know, go go through the, the, the usual procedures, um, like send it to friends and family, use the review groups, um, use Facebook groups, um, even... Um, Use the paid Amazon seller, uh, the the professional Amazon reviewers. You know, there's a couple of people on there that you can approach. Obviously, you need to give it nearly for free. Um, but yeah, get social proof first, and then go heavy on PPC. Yeah. Um, wait for maybe fifteen to twenty to twenty-five uh, reviews, yeah. and then switch on PPC and go heavy on on the budget. You know. Don't be shy to spend fifty dollars or obviously more a day on 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 PPC. Yeah. And you know, all the while, if you haven't done it yet, start building Facebook pages um, or a fan page or start building a mailing list. You know, um, try to get your customers e emails so you can retarget them for for your for your next product. Mm -hmm. What are some of the best practices for importing that we didn't talk about so far? Manual. Did you read my book? <laughs> <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, best practices importing. Um, I'd say just follow the six-step import process that um, that I lined out in in the book, um, and memorize the steps. Um, and and you're good. I think. Um, I mean, I do cover a lot more, for example, in, in online course that I mm -hmm. have. Um, I don't give everything away for free. Um, yeah, so tell me about that, actually, because you have several services you offer. What, mm -hmm. what do people come to you for? Because obviously you have the Mandarin gear, right? So you sell your own, your own brand. What else? What other services do you um, offer that people should <clears throat> look, look you up for? Uh, I have Import Dojo. Import Dojo is yep. uh, is a blog yep. where I post uh, every other week. Yep. Um, on Import Dojo, I have an online course as well uh, that focuses on importing from China. I do cover, I think, one third of the course is about Amazon, but only the basics. To be honest, I'm right. working on an advanced module right now that I'm releasing in in November. But two thirds of the course is about importing from China because I think it's the most crucial part of the entire business. Yeah. Because Amazon, I mean, it's not easy, but it's a clear process on Amazon, you know. Right. And if you follow it, you can be successful. But importing from China can be so many different scenarios, um, and you need to know how to tackle each scenario, and and that is what I cover in the course. Yeah. Um. I also sell uh, my my books on Amazon, uh, all four books that I wrote. Mm -hmm. um, then I also have my courses on on Udemy, where you on on Udemy you only have the course, but on Import Dojo I give one on one coaching. Yeah. So I hold people's hand along the journey. I tell them um, which categories are good. I, they can email me with problems that gotcha. they have with the suppliers. I have Google Hangouts with them. Yeah. So it's coaching. Yeah. So what about, let's say, I want to skip everything. I want you one-on-one. -on -one. I want you to help with sourcing. Do they get your course or is that a separate service that they can get you for? Uh, it's a separate service. Yeah. Um, I offer, uh, <coughs> excuse me. I offer a flat service um, package, yeah. a flat rate package for, for sourcing. So say you're looking for, um, I don't know, T-shirt, tapestry, whatever in yeah. China and you, you have a link you have a certain idea of your quantity that you're right. looking for. Uh, I help locating a factory. If I don't know anyone, I go look, but I don't yeah. use the, the regular channels like Alibaba or Global Sources. I use my, my contacts mostly. Yeah. What other, besides Alibaba, pe people probably ask you this. What else, what's the next best source that people should look at online? 
Um, I'd say Global Sources. Mm -hmm. Global Sources is uh, very professional. I also did a screencast recently about them. I'm not sure if you saw. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. then there is Taobao, which is the Chinese version of Alibaba, but mm -hmm. you can work with Google Translate. Mm -hmm. um, then you have epath.com, then you have madeinchina.com, mm -hmm. um, ebuy.com, and a couple others. But you know, the the more you look out for for the other e-commerce site, the, the thinner the field gets in terms of suppliers on the sites. I mean, for example, there's AliExpress for for drop shipping, so that works well if you're looking for small quantities and low, still okay prices. But the main two sites, Alibaba, Global Sources. Yeah, what's been the biggest challenges in the business today? Um, my biggest challenge has been. To today? Yeah, yeah, recently. Um, coping with capacity. Um, <laughs> right now I'm running full steam. For example, after this interview, I have the Google Hangout. Then uh, I probably have two, three hours of uh, sourcing. Then I have uh, emails um, that I have to take care of. Then uh, lots of things. Um, mm -hmm. So right now I'm, I'm, I'm running at full capacity. So uh, I need to expand. Um, in terms of uh, sourcing, I need to hire people to help me on the consulting, um, and also, you know, I want to scale my my business on Amazon. I want to grow that. So right now, I need to hire more people, more employees, more staff. So, what are you gonna do to do uh, that? <laughs> I've been looking already uh, at a couple people. Um, I'm talking to uh, one of my best friends in the next, in the coming weeks. Uh, yeah. He's currently traveling. But I already um, explained him what I had in mind. He also kind of runs his own business, so I kind of I want to bring him on as a partner and yeah. then double the size of staff. And yeah. I ask because this is stuff people are going through who are watching this, right? They're at capacity. What mm -hmm. do they do to grow, right? And so you you kind of mapped out some of those next steps that you need to do. Um, One of my my um, my biggest issues in the beginning was I took too much money out of my business. You know, I kind of still lived the same lifestyle I had when I had a monthly paycheck. Mm. You know, uh, going on trips, eating out, and so on. So I took money out of my business, and that uh, stalled my growth. Um, I was I was working harder and harder and harder. You know, but I was taking out too much money. So that's an advice I would give to people who are starting out, you know, leave the money inside. Maybe start start this as a part-time job and leave the money you make on the side, leave that in the business and yeah. reinvest it, you know. That's Especially when you're state. dealing with physical goods like you are, you have to actually pay for yeah. the, the goods, exactly, yeah. you know. Yeah. If someone buys your course, you know, it's a little bit different story than you're paying for a thousand Bluetooth headsets, you know. What do you find has been the toughest about running this type of business? Um, the toughest? I think that you have no one to tell you which direction to go to. I mean, previously I always had a, a supervisor or a boss right. who hopefully pointed me into a, a right direction, you know, or who gave me ideas for resources or right. or even he had a boss who... <clears throat> who led the company, you know, but right now I'm my own boss, I'm responsible for my own success, you know, and, and I need to constantly look out for for new directions where my business can go or what obstacles <clears throat> I might come across, you know, yeah. so I think that's difficult because you have no one to tell you what to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Manuel, so what software do you use to run the business that people should be looking at? Um, personally, I to find new products, I, I use the old-fashioned way. But I do use, for example, um, Jungle Scout to, to analyze mm -hmm. uh, the numbers. Yep. Um, obviously, I use um, Microsoft Office, everything that you can use, like PowerPoint, Excel, Word. And um, I also use Wave Apps for my accounting. Mm. I don't know what that uh, is. You know, what is it? No. Uh, it's a U.S. company. It's called... I think wave-apps.com. It's it's a software wave like the oh, wave. Oh, wave wave apps. Okay. Yeah, wave apps, and um, 
I use it for my invoicing, mm. accounting, um, listing products uh, within my my system. But other than that, I don't use any software. I'm pretty old fashioned. Yeah. <laughs> What's your method for <laughs> research? Like, let's say you hear um, something. I don't, how do you generate new ideas? And then, how do you actually? What's your method for researching those? Uh, I do mention it also a couple of times. Um, I use a lot of. I subscribe to a lot of um, trendy websites like um, uh, TechCrunch or mm -hmm. um, uh, pff, what else? Um, you were mentioning I Kickstarter mean, is one of them. Kickstarter, yeah. and Gadget, um, anything that has trendy stuff, or yeah. I even uh, subscribe to uh, supermarkets or. Mm. Um, DIY stores, you know, right. um, and then they send newsletter every week with the newest products. And there yeah. you go, you know, you have a, a free list of products every other week from from different kind of categories. Right. I think that's where I get most of my inspiration. That's smart. And yeah. uh, uh, also exhibitions help. So I'm, sh I'm I mean, there's uh, also local exhibitions you can go to. Um, what else? Uh, travel, uh, travel a lot as much as you can. You know, um, you might see a product that is really popular in the state next to you, that could be popular in your state as well. You know, right. so import it, stuff like this. Yeah, um, yeah like I said. So you find something. Way. Let's say you get a in gadget email and you find something. Then what? What's your thought process? What's your method to actually doing the research to see if yes, I want to <laughs> pursue this further. Okay, well, I probably go look on on similar websites first. For example, if uh, N Gadget sent me a review of a really cool gadget or really cool tool that just came out, and uh, I probably look on other competitors. For example, they say uh, Sony has just brought out the uh, the newest um, I don't know digital camera. You know, I go on to maybe Panasonic or Philips or. Um, you know all the other big brands to see if if they also carry it. Yeah. If the competition is small, I try to find the source. Um, if if I can't find the source, um, I probably have to do more research. Back to square one. And um, you know, once I find the source, I try to get prices and maybe even try to improve the product. Obviously, I don't improve a Sony digital camera, but um, right. you know, get the general idea. Maybe add some of your ideas. Brainstorm a little bit, you know. Sit down for for a couple of minutes and think about: Could anyone actually use this product? Would people buy this product? Yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. What about what's your opinion on, like you mentioned with Kickstarter? There's a lot of technology products. What do you recommend mm -hmm. for as far as crowdfunding goes? Do you think it's good? It's not good? What you know? If your students say, you know, um, Manuel, I want to go and why don't I just have the crowd pay for it ahead of time and then I'll do it? What What's your opinion on crowdsourcing sites? I think it's pretty cool. Um, a friend of mine just completed a, a project for um, glasses that you can use indoors mm -hmm. uh, when you sit a lot of in, when you sit a lot of the uh, when you sit in front of the computer a lot, mm. sorry, uh, or when you read a lot on tablets or your smartphone. Yeah. and he did nearly three hundred thousand euro. Wow. And uh, super successful. Um, and actually, I'm also working on a Kickstarter right now with, mm. with this very same friend. Mm. Um, it's completely out of the industry that I, that I actually work in. Mm -hmm. um, because I saw his success, I'm, I was like really motivated to do it myself. Um, but maybe it's a bit easier for me than for, for your listeners because um, I'm directly at the source, you know, I can find factories easy, I can go yeah. to exhibitions. So yeah, use Kickstarter by, by all means, but make sure that you can find a factory who can actually produce the product, you know, yeah. and to, to check if the um, functionality can be done in the manufacturing process. Yeah. 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 You know, so Manuel, since it's the Scubana e-commerce mastery series, my question what would you say your lowest moment has been? And then on the flip side, what's been the proudest moment? Um, good question. The lowest moment, 
it's probably happened within time span of two or three days to the best moment. Um, I think I got a um, the lowest moment was definitely uh, earlier this year. I had a cancellation of an order from a big retailer, and um, I had to cover a lot of costs with the the factory. Um, that cost me quite a couple of thousands, and um, it was like I was devastated. My whole savings were gone from the previous wow. six to eight months that I was working on, and then like a week later, I received the biggest order yet from another retailer in, in Switzerland uh, that pretty much cleared off <laughs> everything again and uh, yeah, kept me going. Uh, so both within a time span of a couple, I think it was within two weeks. Wow. Um, was it the yeah, same product? Know. No, it's, it was they a were different, different product. Um, but the, the first retailer, he just canceled, you know, and it's a big retailer, um, couldn't do anything. Um, so I was stuck with uh, a lot of debt also in, ter in re regards to the supplier yeah. and then just a couple of days later I received a really big order with a very nice profit. That's a big fear I think for people going to retails if they return it or cancel it. Definitely, yeah. Um, that's why you need to have agreements in place. I mean I did have an agreement in place with that customer right. but uh, you know they also have a contract that I needed to sign and there's a lot of clauses in there. Right. <laughs> like basically <laughs> what we sign for you is, is null and void and this overrides that or something. More, more or less like that. Yeah. yeah. So there was no way I could get my money back, you know. So yeah, So what do you do? Just what do you do? Do you just hustle and sell it to another retailer? Or what do, what do you do in that case? No, that order that I got was um was also long time preparation. You know, I was working on that order for a long time, yeah. and I was lucky in that case. But I guess what you could do with um, if you're already in the production process and the customer cancels the order, <sighs> try to sell it to to another yeah. client. You know, hustle, 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 yeah. hustle. So how did you okay. get that big order? The proudest moment. Um, Actually, it was through one of my contacts, and uh, I've been working on that since I started my own company, so it took it took nearly um, 11 months to get the order. Mm. Uh, I was sending a lot of samples. I sent a lot of... I spent hours working on their Excel files that yeah. they wanted me to, to fill out. Um, I had lots of phone calls. I had video conferences. I even traveled to Switzerland to meet them. So it was a lot of money and, and time and, mm. and work involved, yeah. definitely. So what did you do to celebrate? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't really celebrate orders that much. No? I, mean, I guess just high five to myself. Yeah. <laughs> no, I do uh, I do enjoy the, the occasional dinner outside with my wife. Yeah. Um, I exercise a lot, so... Um, I compensate with uh, with sports a lot, fitness, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this has been hugely valuable. I really appreciate your time with this. And, um, you know, I've read through your, your blog posts and your YouTube videos, so I suggest people check those out because there's a, a wealth of information there. Um, and I have one last question before I ask it. Where should we send people? Uh, obviously, importdojo.com, any other places that – we should point people towards? Um, Importdojo.com. I think you've got mm -hmm. everything you need yeah. over there. Yeah. Uh, if you're only interested in reading my books, um, I'd be happy to give you the links of my Amazon books also. Um, I think they can get they can sign up for the newsletter and get get the book, one of the books, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. The Import Guide is free. and yeah. I mean, I do sell it on Amazon, but you can get it for free on my site. Right. Please don't tell anyone. Yeah. No, but uh, um, importdojo.com, uh, if people want to learn in, in general about sourcing or exhibitions in China, go to yeah. uh, globalsources.com where you f will find a lot of tutorials yeah. and, um, and free content. Um, yeah. yeah. So my last question, Manuel, is what are some of your best business and product ideas that people should steal because you are not going to use them? Because you're just at capacity. Okay. Um, go into, um, I think I've said it before, go into um, 
what's it called? Um, Are you talking about website or? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, I'm talking about products. Um, virtual reality. Sorry, virtual reality. Anything with virtual reality, I think it's it's a big deal, and mm. uh, I see a lot of suppliers now trying to develop, but they have no idea um, because there is no. Um, uh, there is no guideline or anywhere from from the industry, so that would be an industry I think is really worth investing mm. your time in. I, I would, I'd love to, but I have no time. And um, other than that, not sure, not sure. I <laughs> why would I want to give it away? <laughs> no, but um, virtual reality. All right, virtual reality. All right, yeah. Check out importdojo.com manual. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. No problem. Thanks a lot for having me. Thank you. Thanks.